Hi everybody, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is me, Catalyst Echo here from Catalyst Echo Designs, and I am here with another live painting tutorial. And this time we are going to take this 99 cent note card box and turn it into something really, really special, as you saw on the title card. So for this project, you are going to need a box of some sort, a thrifted box. You're going to need something to clean with. I use Dixie Bell's White Lightning. A sprayer to spray things with, um, some paints. I use Dixie Bell Silk in Anchor and Dixie Bell Antebellum Blue. You're going to need some resin, resin details, and several molds. Uh, for I used molds by Zuri Designs Inc. and Alumite Quick Cast Resin. You're going to need some glue. I used E6000. You're going to need a sander, a sanding block. I used my DeWalt orbital sander and a couple of different sanding sponges with different grits. For my DeWalt, I was using 400 grit sandpaper. You are going to need a nail file. That helps get within the little details of the resin pieces. You'll also need an X-Acto knife and skewers. That helps with trimming the molds, but also with just a bunch of different pieces, honestly. Um, <laughs> And I also used a stencil, and of course you're going to need paint brushes. I used a zebra large paint brush uh, and smaller art synthetic art brushes. And I also made use of a heat gun to remove the drying times just a little bit. So here we are. You can see me going through. I've already cleaned the piece, and I'm just doing a light scuff sanding. And then I come back in and clean that off very thoroughly. The most important thing you need to do in terms of making a project stick, making paint stick, making um, glue stick, making anything that you want to do stick is to make sure that your piece is incredibly clean from the get-go. I know it's not fun. I know it's not the most interesting part of it, but it is really important. And that's why I like to stress prep in all of my videos. So now we're just getting done with that part and we're, start, we're gonna start working on the paints. And as you can see, that's my Dixie Bell Silken Anchor. I have chosen to use a large paintbrush, which will assist me in covering as quickly as possible with as few paint uh, brush strokes as possible. So you just wanna paint, you don't wanna overwork it too much, just paint just a few strokes on each side few strokes on each side. As you can see, I don't mind if I get paint all over my hands, but you can wear gloves if you just so desire. I really do love the process of watching the first coat of paint go on. It just really, really makes it, it's like after you do all that work of cleaning and prep and all of that, it really lets you know that the project is in full swing when you're painting like that. So we did that first coat and I believe now we're going to use heat gun to dry it off. I promise I'll get better at voiceovers eventually. <laughs> so now we're just drying the paint so that we can we can proceed quicker with the rest of the project. <clears throat> and this is something that you just want to be on the lowest heat setting so you don't curdle the paint in any way. Uh, but it does just help, as you can see, to make the paint dry much more quickly. If you're in a hurry like I was that day, a heat gun can be your best tool. Alrighty, so now we're moving on to the next coat. Um, yep, I used two coats of the Dixie Bell Silk and Anchor. Now, silk is a mineral paint where you don't need a primer. Uh, but the one thing about Dixie Bell Silk is you don't want to add any water. So the amount of paint that you use, it takes a little bit of a, uh, it takes a little bit to get the exact right amount. You want to use thin coats, like two thin coats. Rather, you'd rather paint it twice than have to deal with drip marks or uneven brush strokes or something else like that later. So two thin coats is better than one thick coat with that. And it just takes a little bit of time to feel out like what makes a good amount of paint to put on the brush. But all right, so now we're in the part where I'm starting to choose where the stencil or where the uh, molds are going to go. So I've already precast these molds. And I just, I had a bunch of them in there. I knew that they went together. So this is just the process of me choosing and placing how I was gonna do that. And as you can see, 
I'm taking them as I go and I'm trimming them around the edges. I'm trimming around the edges with um, my sanding block to make sure that they're even. Like as I was touching them and feeling them and looking around at them, I realized that some of them had little areas where they were not perfect. They had not been cast perfectly. Not every single time that you cast something, it will come out exactly correct, but that doesn't mean that you have to throw it away. So you're gonna see in here, there's one of the ears that I have to really, really trim quite a lot. And then one of the trim pieces I have to take and cut down to size. So here we are trimming this ear piece. And what I did was I just used an X-Acto and I have a really super sharp one to get rid of all the excess over poured resin. And then I pulled it out, you know, just little, little by little, one by one. I'm using a yoga mat in order to keep my work table safe, like an old yoga mat that that, that was that I didn't need anymore uh, for that. It's a really good thing, honestly. All right, so here we are continuing to trim this up. And this took quite a while um, to trim up. But I think it's worth showing because it just shows that you can, if you do make an overpour by mistake, you don't necessarily have to get rid of it that piece. Just a little bit of work with a sanding block, an X-Acto knife, and a nail file can really help things out a lot. The nail file, the nail file helps, it, it acts like a sanding block, but it gets inside the little details. And it's, it really doesn't take that long in order to, you know, solve the overpour. So here I am <clears throat> trying to work out the best way to put all these, all these different objects together. This is the Door Knocker 1 by Zuri, the Totem, the Seamless Borders 4, and the Gear Set 1 by Zuri Design. Oh, and in there also, before I, before I uh, cut it, was one of the Mandalas from Zuri Designs, Inc. And you can also see in that little basket, I did have the Steampunk bug ready to go as well. But I ended up going with just this one piece from the Seamless Borders 4, the door knocker mold, the knocker itself, and the, I don't know what you call that, the thing that's the actual knocker, I don't know what you call that. Um, but yeah, I ended up going with two gears, the piece from the seamless borders, and the totem and the door knocker for this. I just thought it looked kind of cool, just, just like that. But I knew I was going to have to cut down that seamless borders piece, so I, I believe that that's what we do next. Let's take a look. Oh, and then why my phone is there, I took a photograph of the configuration so that I could get, uh, I could I could remember what I had decided to do. So I kept my phone there with, a, and here I am scoring the piece of the seamless border. But anyway, yeah, that's a really good way of like, just if you're, if you're putting together a lot of different pieces, but then you have to prep those pieces, just take a quick picture on your phone because that'll remind you of exactly where things are supposed to go. So I first started, after I scored it and then broke it off, I first started with my sanding block and then I realized it would be completely easier if I just took my DeWalt sander and used it kind of like a, yeah, you can see I'm doing it here. And I'm, ma I'm just making sure that those edges, that there's absolutely nothing on those edges that is sharp or capable of hurting anybody when they touch it. I wanted them to be like very, very rounded. I did not want them to come away from this, the top of the box at all. Like I just wanted it to fit flush and be rounded so that nothing would get snagged on that piece. That was pretty important to me. So you can see how the edges are very white there. I did both sides, not just the side that I cut, but both sides. All right, and so now I think we're getting to the glue phase. Oh, nope, we're gonna, we're gonna continue to, to sand this down. I uh, got really, really worried that it was going to snag something. So I just wanted to make sure it was absolutely perfect. Now we're going to start gluing. And this is where my E6000 comes in. Um, I, cho I chose to use a plate, like a paper plate that I had left over from a, from a, a food order that I just had lying around. I like to try to recycle these things. If, if I have the choice, I don't get that kind of thing, like paper plates or anything like that. But if they do come to me, I try to use them in my projects just to make sure that they are getting used and not 
going to waste. And so there you can see I pulled up the photo on my phone so I could just make sure that I was putting everything correct. I scuff sanded the back just a little because when you use resin, sometimes that, that very, very shiny back edge can be a little bit uh, difficult. So I always try to make sure I have like a light scuff sand. And there I'm using the totem mold to determine where to put that and marking it with a black Sharpie. So you'll see I go over this a lot with paint. The black Sharpie marks are gone, but I just find that you can use a pencil, you can use whatever, whatever you want. I just happen to have a black Sharpie handy to mark it. And so I, you just mark like the, the, the places that you know are going to be the key points. So like the top edges, the bottom edges, whatever it is, it's going to make it so that you know where it, that it's going where it's And we're just verifying here. So this was going to be the tricky part. And making sure that that back piece was 100% straight. It's actually something that I hesitate to point this out, but it didn't entirely dry straight. And I'm going to watch this. Yeah, see, I can see where I, I, I can see what I must have done. It looks straight there, but it was slightly off in the final piece. I don't really mind it. I think it looks fine. Um, but in the future, I might put something between, you know, two of the molds to make sure that it stays put. Because I was using those gears since they're the same size to judge. Um, but yeah. it turned out fine, though, in my opinion. I think it turned out good. You can be, so you can see I did a lot of that stuff by eye and by using the molds to like determine where the different molds went themselves. Like I was using the mold as my guides. Uh, you can also do measuring, full measuring. I feel like that's definitely worth it if you're, if you're a perfectionist. I am somewhat of a perfectionist, but I was also running a little short on time for this piece. So I knew that I needed to get it up for uh, my design team project. And I wanted to make sure that I just got it done. And the more I let myself linger, like I have a, I have a, there's two ways for me to do it. I can linger in perfectionism and things take forever, or I can just go for it. And one piece of advice that I like to give artists is it's, it's okay, just go for it sometimes. Like it might not always work, but sometimes you're going to come up with something that is absolutely stellar. I really love the way this box came out. A little trick for making sure that paint gets all around and into the little fine, fine details. There's a couple of different ways you can do this. Some people will opt to spray paint these types of really, really super detailed molds. I like to attack it right with my hand. I want things to be a little bit more textured and detailed. I think that I find that more compelling personally. But as you can see, I'm using kind of a, a rounded craft brush and I'm getting into the little details. One way of handling that is kind of go over it first and get the get the thing painted in broad strokes. And then you go through and in there and you move around any excess paint into the little crevices. I always start with my darkest color here. I knew I was working with black for my background, which made it very easy. But you always want to, if you're using color, which is something that I also do a lot, you generally want to, when you work up with a mold, start with the very darkest color and work your way out. Because that will add dimension through um, 
you know, using the, it'll, it'll add like additional dimension to the appearance of, of Deep or Shell. So here we are just going on, our, going on with our second coat. And this really helps, like the second, the first coat, you'll notice details uh, that aren't covered. So you're, you're gonna go in with your second coat. Again, it is two thin coats rather than one thick. So you're going in with your second coat and you're just making sure you've got, you've got to be detail oriented if you're gonna do it this way. Um, you just wanna go in and make sure that all the little details are covered, in particular where it is joined from the mold itself to the box itself. Like that's something that I look out for very, very extremely. And you can see me doing that right there. Like you can see that I'm being very, very thorough, going around each mold. That is more that was more important to me than making sure that each mold was fully covered black because I knew I was going to be going in with decorator waxes over the top. So to me, it was the little minute details that were actually the most important part, like the, the, the parts that sink in, rather than the top part of the mold. So you'll see me like even almost rubbing it off a little bit because it's not important. I know that I'm going to go in there with the, the Zuri wax paste, the, the three that I had, to go and kiss the details. So yeah, we are finishing up the second coat here. And then we're just making sure that everything is coated on the sides as well. And that there were no like there were no like paint drips or anything like that along the sides. And that everything was as evenly coated as possible. All right, right on. Now it looks like it's time for us to dry and wait for the final step. Oh, right. While I was waiting for the top part to dry, when it was mostly dry, but the little inner details were not dry, I went in with and did the sides with the stencil. So here's the time in which I've done that. So I've done this a couple of different times on different videos, uh, but you use your pixie spray in order to get adhesive on the back of the stencil. And then you just go in with the lightest and driest of brushes. It doesn't really, in terms of like a stencil brush, you just want to the flat edge to uh, stipple and do your stencil. And I like my stencils to be a little bit, uh, a little bit grungy. So I kind of pick the keyframe points that I want to highlight. And then I, I bring, with an incredibly dry brush sort of technique, I bring the color away so that it's not exactly 100% evenly covered because I want something that looks a little bit more, I usually want something that looks a little bit more faded. My whole thing with stencils, especially stencils that look like that, are that I want it to look kind of faded. And that's what I did. So you can repeat this process. Oh, that was me making sure that everything was perfectly dry. The benefit of dry of using a dry brush stencil technique is that it dries pretty quickly, but I just wanted to make sure before I flipped it over and put it down that it was 100% dry. So I went over it with my heat gun. The heat gun is a very, very important tool for a painter, especially if you're doing things and you want to uh, maximize your... Like you, you're, you don't want to spend a lot of time just waiting for paint to dry. Obviously, waiting for paint to dry is boring. That's what people say. They're like, it's, 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 it's as... Uh, as dull as watching paint dry, and it is. Watching paint dry and waiting for paint to dry is a big part of what I do, but the heat gun helps. So you just wanna be careful though, and you can see me kissing the, the edges the edges of the top, like the top edges with that antebellum blue. So I was waiting for that to be dry. And then I'm placing the stencil on the top, and I'm overlapping it with where, if I were to, if the stencil were to be folded over to include the front, I've made sure to include that. So I kind of marked on the stencil. You can't really see this. I wish I had pushed this a little bit forward so you could see this, but I kind of marked on the stencil like where it needed to be for the top so that I could then continue the design. You can see a lot of artists will 
have nicely manicured hands when they uh, do their art. I wish I could do it like that, but I like the feel of feeling things with my actual hands, so I don't want to wear gloves. Manicured hands are just not for me. So there you go, you can see that I've continued the design. Now it is time for the dry time. We're gonna, we're gonna hit it up with the heat gun just to make sure that it is fully dry. And just look at that, just the tops just a little bit. The more multi-layered dimension you can add, the better. So I knew I was gonna be using the Bora Bora Blue and Phoenix Blaze Copper and the Venetian Gold Wax Case that Zuri had seated next to me there. Uh, but I wanted to just give them a base so that they didn't have to shine so brightly against the black. Like, I wanted the blue to really pop. Um, so that's why I did that, why I kissed those edges with that. And then, as you can see, I am sitting, I am uh, applying the last resin piece. And that is fully dried. I did end up spraying the back just to make sure it was a perfectly even coat. I did end up spraying the back with black ribbon. Very, very matte black spray paint. So just as an FYI, I used a Kylan chalkboard paint for that. Um, I just wanted it to make sure that if anybody like looked in the little, you know, like try to get in there with a, with a with pen light or something, that it was fully, fully covered. So yeah, and then you can see I have marked on the stencil with a Sharpie where the glue needs to go. Like I've marked on the, um, like around the, the, the totem where the glue needed to go. So, yeah, and then I'm just pushing it into place with the skewers. Skewers are intensely, intensely important for, um, for gluing. Because you can get rid of all the little strings and all the little bloops that come out. go. You see me adding uh, adding the stencil on, pushing it pushing it down, and then removing as much of the glue from around the outsides as I can. And that's about it. So, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you did, please, go, please be sure to drop me a like and subscribe to find out for part two. Part two is the full Monty of customization for this piece and it was a multi-layered paint and wax extravaganza it's my favorite part but i thought that this part was important to, to put up first the other video should be edited and live by the end of the week so i really enjoyed making this project um, i really enjoyed every part of it actually it was something that I wasn't planning on doing when I did it. The project that I had planned for that day, a couple of things didn't work out. And I, I, there was, I was waiting for something to come in the mail that hadn't come yet. So anyway, um, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video, which will be the continuation of this piece. Bye.